we get to choose. Do we want stasis and rationing? Or do we want dynamism and growth? This is an easy choice. We know what we want. We just have to get busy. If we're out in the solar system, we can have a trillion humans in the solar system, which means we'd have a 1,000 Mozarts and a 1,000 Einsteins. This would be an incredible civilization. What could this future look like? Where would a trillion humans live? Well, it's very interesting. Somebody named Jerry O'Neill, a physics professor, looked at this question very carefully. And he asked, a, a, he asked a very precise question that nobody had ever asked before. And it was, is a planetary surface the best place for humans to expand into the solar system? And he and his students set to work on answering that question. And they came to a very surprising, for them, counterintuitive answer. No. Why not? Well, they came up with a bunch of problems. One is that other planetary surfaces aren't that big. You're talking about maybe a doubling at best. It's not that much. They're a long way away. Round trip times to Mars are on the order of years. And launch opportunities to Mars are only once every 22 months, which is a very significant logistics problem. And last, you're far enough away that you're not going to be able to do real-time communications with Earth. You're going to be limited by speed of light lag. You're certainly, the kids sitting in here, probably some of the adults too, don't even think about playing Fortnite with somebody on Earth. That is not going to work. Most fundamentally, these other planetary surfaces do not have and cannot have Earth normal gravity. You're going to be stuck with whatever gravitational field they have. In the case of Mars, that's one third G. So instead, what O'Neill and his students came up with was the idea of manufactured worlds rotated to create artificial gravity with centrifugal force. These are very large structures, miles on end, and they hold a million people or more each. Here's the International Space Station for scale. This is a very different kind of space colony. Let's take a look at what they might look like inside. High-speed transport, agricultural areas. We added a little drone there. Cities in the background. Some of them would be more recreational. They don't have to have the same gravity. You could have a recreational one that keeps zero G so that you can go flying with your own wings. Some would be national parks. These are really pleasant places to live. Some of these O'Neill colonies might choose to replicate Earth cities. They might pick historical cities and mimic them in some way. There'd be whole new kinds of architecture. These are very, these are ideal climates. These are shirt sleeve environments. This is Maui on its best day all year long. No rain, no storms, no earthquakes. What does the architecture even look like when it no longer has its primary purpose of shelter? We'll find out. But these are beautiful. People are going to want to live here. And they can be close to Earth so that you can return, which is important because people are going to want to return to Earth. They're not going to want to leave Earth forever. They'll also be really easy to go between. The amount of energy required 
to go between these O'Neill colonies, from one to another, to visit friends, to visit family, to visit one that's a recreational area, very, very low energy needs to transport, and quickly, it's a day trip. This is a very interesting video clip I'm gonna show you. This is Professor O'Neill, the guy who, with his students, came up with the idea of what's now called O'Neill colonies, and the famous science fiction author Isaac Asimov, being interviewed about these colonies. And Asimov gets asked a very good question, which is, did anybody in science fiction ever predict this? And if not, why not? And he has a very good answer. Watch this. Did you anticipate anything like this in any of your science fiction? Nobody did, really, because we've all been planet chauvinists. We've all believed people should live on the surface of a planet of a world. I've had colonies on the moon, so have a hundred other science fiction writers. The closest I came to a manufactured world in free space was to suggest that we go out to the asteroid belt and hollow out the asteroids and make ships out of them. It never occurred to me to bring the material from the asteroids in towards the Earth where conditions are pleasanter and build the worlds there. Planetary chauvinists. All right, if we build this vision, these O'Neill colonies, where does it take us? What does it mean for Earth? Earth ends up zoned residential and light industry. It'll be a beautiful place to live. It'll be a beautiful place to visit. It'll be a beautiful place to go to college and, and to do some light industry. But heavy industry and all the polluting industry, all the things that are damaging our planet, those will be done off Earth. We get to have both. We get to preserve this unique gem of a planet which is completely irreplaceable. There is no plan B. We have to save this planet. And we shouldn't give up a future for our grandchildren's grandchildren of dynamism and growth. We can have both. Who is gonna do this work? Not me. These kids in the front rows, you guys are going to do this, and your children are going to do this. This is going to take a long time. This is a big vision. And what you're going to do is you're going to build whole industries. There are going to be thousands of future companies doing this work. A whole ecosystem of entrepreneurial activity unleashed, creative people coming up with new ideas about how to use space, but those companies, those entrepreneurial companies, cannot exist today. It's impossible. And the reason is the price of admission to do interesting things in space right now is just too high. 